the mainstream narrative that cholesterol causes heart disease is controversial. LDL and total cholesterol have absolutely nothing to do with the development of heart disease. As long as you have high HDL, increasing LDL has very little risk. Very little cardiac risk, and we see that over and over and over. Cholesterol myth has been debunked a long time ago. HDL cholesterol is not caused by HDL cholesterol and low triglycerides are associated with lower risk of heart disease. The overwhelming majority of practicing clinicians in the world have no clue what ApoB is. They don't know what the metrics are for it. They don't know what the levels are for it. They wouldn't know how to treat it. My name is Dr. Gary McGowan. I'm a medical doctor with a certificate in lipidology. And today we're going to talk about cholesterol and heart disease. Heart disease is the leading killer of humans worldwide with almost 9 million deaths each year. But it doesn't have to be this way because heart disease is preventable. In this video, we're going to clear this up and you are going to learn the truth about how plaque develops, the history of statins and how they work, whether or not statins actually help or if they harm, what role your diet and lifestyle can play, how statins impact your muscles and what blood tests to get to learn the truth about your heart health. Given that most heart disease is the result of plaque building up, we need to ask ourselves, where does this plaque come from? The plaque comes from fats in the blood, specifically cholesterol. This cholesterol is carried on low density lipoproteins, better known as LDL. These LDL particles get retained within the wall of the artery in a concentration dependent manner. What this means is that the more LDL particles you have, the more plaque you will develop. And this is where statins come in. Statins were first developed in the 1970s by Dr. Akira Endo. And you know where they came from? Citrus fruits, from the fungus Penicillium citrum, making them a natural discovery. So these statins were found in nature and then made available as medications in 1987. And this marked a turning point in the field of cardiology. Since then, statins have evolved. They've been made more effective with fewer side effects and have saved millions of lives worldwide. And this begs the question, how do they actually work? Statins are HMG CoA reductase inhibitors. This is an enzyme responsible for the synthesis of cholesterol within your cells. So when we inhibit this enzyme, this leads to a reduction in cholesterol synthesis, the increase in the expression of LDL receptors, and this leads to clearance of these LDL particles from circulation. There are also other mechanisms that when put together lead to the stability and regression of plaque within the blood vessels. So when someone has high LDL cholesterol, what actually happens when they take a statin? Normally, we expect to see a reduction of about 40 to 50%. And given the close relationship between LDL cholesterol and the development of plaque within the blood vessels, we see a reduction in heart attacks that is proportional to this cholesterol lowering. Specifically, for every one millimole reduction in LDL cholesterol, the risk of having a heart attack reduces by 22% over five years. This translates to a longer life for those on statin therapy with a 10% risk reduction in all causes of death per one millimole reduction. With that said, you would be a fool to think that medications are always 100% safe. The reality is that all medications have side effects. This includes statins, and one of those of concern for many people is statin-related muscle pain. And while this is a real phenomenon, it's likely that it's been vastly overestimated previously. Best evidence we have with up-to-date research suggests that up to 90% of cases of statin-related muscle pain are attributable to the nocebo effect. This is because when studies have given subjects either a placebo or a statin, where both groups thought they were taking the statin, this same statin-related muscle pain was observed in the placebo group, suggesting that the majority of cases of these symptoms are not actually the result of the medication itself. This doesn't mean that there are no side effects, and individuals respond differently to medications. So for those who do have side effects, it's good to know that other cholesterol-lowering therapies are available and this is something you should speak to your doctor about to explore your options. But it's not all about medicine. Diet and lifestyle plays a really important role and we know that changing your diet can reduce your LDL cholesterol, just not quite to the same extent. Here are the most important changes to make to your diet to reduce your LDL cholesterol. Firstly, try to reduce your saturated fat intake and increase your intake of unsaturated fats. Many people say that saturated fat, often in the form of animal fats, are actually good for us and that we should eat more of them. But this is misguided because what we see in the research is that those who consume more saturated fat tend to have higher levels of LDL cholesterol 
and as a result, a higher rate of cardiovascular events. This is because when people are fed a lot of saturated fat, the expression of LDL receptors is reduced. And if we have less receptors, we're going to have more of those LDL particles in circulation. It's also really important to reduce your consumption of processed junk foods like sweets, crisps, chocolate, and fast food. This isn't just about specific ingredients like the types of fats, or the sugars, or refined starches, but also about the effect of a diet rich in these foods, which can cause obesity, and poor metabolic health, both of which contribute to your risk of heart disease. Eating more fruits, vegetables, and sources of fiber is also a powerful way to reduce heart disease risk, both through cholesterol lowering and other health promoting effects of these foods. Finally, you can also consider adding some functional foods to your diet, such as plant sterols, as these have also been shown in the latest science to reduce your LDL cholesterol. It's very clear the diet is important, but the higher your LDL cholesterol is, the more likely it is that you may require medication. So don't be afraid to take that step if you need to. But how do you know if you need to in the first place? Well, you have to start by getting your bloods tested. Blood lipid tests can be confusing, even for doctors. So here, I wanna break down the most important tests to consider and what they actually mean. Your total cholesterol is typically what you see first on a blood lipid report. And this gives a gross assessment of the cholesterol carried on various lipoproteins. If it's high, this is useful information, but it doesn't tell us the whole story. The next thing we see is high density lipoprotein or HDL cholesterol. This is typically referred to as good cholesterol. And this is because a generally healthy lifestyle is associated with higher HDL cholesterol. And while it's not quite as simple as increased HDL cholesterol equals reduced cardiovascular risk, it is generally a positive indicator of health. You'll also see triglycerides measured on your blood tests. And high triglycerides can also be harmful for heart disease risk, especially when coupled with low HDL cholesterol and high LDL cholesterol. And this profile, referred to as atherogenic dyslipidemia, is often seen in those with metabolic disease, such as type 2 diabetes. Then we get to LDL cholesterol. This tells us the amount of cholesterol carried on LDL lipoproteins, but this is not always present on a blood test. Sometimes all you'll see is non-HDL cholesterol. And this brings us to an important point, that when we look at these blood tests, such as LDL cholesterol, we're getting a gross assessment of the cholesterol that's on those types of proteins in your blood. But what's actually more important, if you have it available, is a test called ApoB. ApoB stands for apolipoprotein B. And this can be found on LDL particles, but also other non-LDL particles that can still contribute to the development of plaque. And therefore, when we measure the number of ApoB particles in circulation, we get a better idea of the total number of plaque-causing particles that are in our blood. And finally, there's also a specialized blood test called LP little a. This stands for lipoprotein A, and high levels of LP little a increase risk of cardiovascular disease dramatically. Importantly, this is almost entirely genetically determined, and to date, there aren't great therapies to reduce it, but knowing your levels can give you an indication as to what your overall cardiovascular disease risk is. Because this is largely genetically determined and isn't really influenced by lifestyle or medication at the moment, this LP little a test is best carried out at one point in your life and needn't be followed up over time until, of course, we have medications to reduce it. If you want to learn more about constructing a diet to optimize your health, check out this next video right here.